Hello and welcome back to our channel everyone. Today the topic is how to do a statistical analysis. We are going to provide you a step-by-step -step guide on how you can perform a statistical analysis on your own. So without any further delay, let us head straight away to the topic. What is statistical analysis? Statistical analysis is the use of quantitative data to investigate trends, patterns, and relationships. Scientists, governments, businesses, and other organizations rely on it for research. To reach valid conclusions, the statistical analysis must be carefully planned from the beginning of the research process. You must define your hypothesis and decide on your research design, sample size, and sampling procedure. After collecting data from your sample, you can use descriptive statistics to organize and summarize the information. Then, you can use inferential statistics to formally test hypotheses and make population estimates. Finally, you will be able to interpret and generalize your findings. This video provides students and researchers with a hands-on introduction to statistical analysis. We'll walk you through the procedure. Step 1, Develop Your Hypothesis and Research Design To collect valid data for statistical analysis, you must first define your hypotheses and design your research. Developing Statistical Hypotheses The goal of research is frequently to look into a relationship between variables in a population. You begin with a prediction and then use statistical analysis to put that prediction to the test. A statistical hypothesis is a formal way of making a population prediction. Every research prediction is broken down into null and alternative hypotheses that can be tested with sample data. While the null hypothesis always predicts that there will be no effect or relationship between variables, the alternative hypothesis expresses your research prediction of an effect or relationship. Prepare your research design. A research design is your overall data collection and analysis strategy. It determines which statistical tests you can use later to test your hypothesis. Determine whether your research will be descriptive, correlational, or experimental. Experiments influence variables directly, whereas descriptive and correlational studies only measure variables. In an experimental design, you can use statistical tests of comparison or regression to assess a cause and effect relationship, for example, the effect of meditation on test scores. Using correlation coefficients and significance tests, a correlational design can investigate relationships between variables, for example, parental income and GPA, without making any assumptions about causality. In a descriptive design, you can study the characteristics of a population or phenomenon, for example, the prevalence of anxiety among college students in the United States, by using statistical tests to draw conclusions from sample data. Your research design will also determine whether you will compare participants on a group or individual basis, or both. A between-subjects design compares the group-level outcomes of participants who received different treatments, for example, those who performed a meditation exercise vs those who did not. A within-subjects design compares repeated measures from study participants who have received all treatments, example scores from before and after performing a meditation exercise. A mixed, factorial, design changes one variable between subjects while changing another within subjects, for example, pre-test and post-test scores from participants who did or did not do a meditation exercise. Variables are measured. When developing a research design, operationalize your variables and decide how you will measure them. For statistical analysis, consider the level of measurement of your variables, which indicates the type of data they contain, categorical data represent classifications. These can be nominal, for example, gender, or ordinal, e.g. level of language ability. Amounts are represented by quantitative data. These can be on an interval scale, for example, a test score, or a ratio scale, e.g. age. Many variables can be measured with varying degrees of precision. Age data for example, can be quantitative, 8 years old, or categorical, young. If a variable is coded numerically, example level of agreement from 1 to 5, this does not imply that it is quantitative rather than categorical. 
Choosing appropriate statistics and hypothesis tests requires determining the measurement level. A mean score, for example, can be calculated with quantitative data but not with categorical data. Along with measures of your variables of interest, you'll frequently collect data on relevant participant characteristics in a research study. Step 2. Gather data from a sample. In most cases, collecting data from every member of the population you want to study is too difficult or expensive. Instead, you'll gather information from a sample. As long as you use appropriate sampling procedures, statistical analysis allows you to apply your findings beyond your own sample. You should strive for a population representative sample. Sample collection for statistical analysis. There are two methods for selecting a sample. Probability sampling means that every member of the population has a chance of being chosen for the study at random. Non-probability sampling, some members of the population are more likely than others to be chosen for the study due to factors such as convenience or voluntary self-selection. In theory, for highly generalizable results, you should use a probability sampling method. Random sampling reduces sampling bias and ensures that the data from your sample is representative of the population. When data is collected using probability sampling, parametric tests can be used to make strong statistical inferences. In practice, however, obtaining the ideal sample is rarely possible. Non-probability samples, while more likely to be biased, are much easier to recruit and collect data from. Non-parametric tests are more appropriate for non-probability samples, but they produce weaker population inferences. If you want to use parametric tests on non-probability samples, you must demonstrate, sample is representative of the population to which you are extrapolating your findings. Sample is free of systematic bias. Remember that external validity implies that you can only generalize your findings to others who share the characteristics of your sample. Results from Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic samples, for example, college students in the United States, are not necessarily applicable to all non-weird populations. If you use parametric tests on data from non-probability samples, make sure to explain in your discussion section how far your results can be generalized. Create a suitable sampling procedure. Determine how you will recruit participants based on the resources available for your research. Will you have the resources to widely publicize your research, including outside of your university setting? Will you be able to gather a diverse sample that represents a broad population? Do you have time to reach out to and follow up with members of difficult-to-reach groups? Determine an appropriate sample size. Decide on your sample size before recruiting participants either by looking at other studies in your field or by using statistics. A sample that is too small may be unrepresentative of the entire sample, whereas a sample that is too large will be more expensive than necessary. There are numerous sample size calculators available online. Depending on whether you have subgroups or how rigorous your study should be, different formulas are used, example in clinical research. A minimum of 30 units or more per subgroup is required as a rule of thumb. To use these calculators, you must first understand and enter the following key components, the risk of rejecting a true null hypothesis that you are willing to take, usually set at 5%. Statistical power, the likelihood that your study will detect an effect of a certain size if one exists, which is usually 80% or higher. Expected effect size, a standardist indication of how large your study's expected result will be, usually based on other similar studies. Population standard deviation, an estimate of the population parameter based on previous research or your own pilot study. Step 3, use descriptive statistics to summarize your data. After you've gathered all of your data, you can examine it and generate descriptive statistics that summarize it. Examine your data. There are several methods for inspecting your data, including the following, data from each variable is organized in frequency distribution tables. Data from a key variable is displayed in a bar chart to show the distribution of responses. A scatter plot is used to visualize the relationship between two variables. 
you can assess whether your data has a skewed or normal distribution and whether there are any outliers or missing data by visualizing it in tables and graphs. A normal distribution means that your data is symmetrically distributed around a center where the majority of the values are concentrated, with values tapering off at the tail ends. A skewed distribution, on the other hand, is asymmetric and has more values on one end than the other. Only a few descriptive statistics should be used with skewed distributions, so keep the shape of the distribution in mind. Extreme outliers can also produce misleading statistics, so dealing with these values may necessitate a systematic approach. Calculate central tendency measures. Measures of central tendency describe the location of the majority of the values in a data set. There are three main measures of central tendency that are frequently reported, 1 the mode is the most common response or value in the data set. 2 the median is the value that is exactly in the middle of the data set when ordered from low to high. 3 the mean is defined as the sum of all values divided by the number of values. However, depending on the distribution's shape and measurement level, only one or two of these measures may be appropriate. Many demographic characteristics, for example, can only be described using the mode or proportions, whereas a variable such as reaction time may not have a mode at all. Determine variability measures. Variability measures indicate how widely distributed the values in a data set are. There are four major measures of variability that are frequently reported, one range, the data set's highest value minus its lowest value. Two interquartile range, the range of the data set's middle half. 3. The average distance between each value in your data set and the mean is the standard deviation. 4. Variance is defined as the square of the standard deviation. Once again, your choice of variability statistics should be guided by the shape of the distribution and the level of measurement. For skewed distributions, the interquartile range is the best measure, while standard deviation and variance provide the most information for normal distributions. Step 4. Using inferential statistics, test hypotheses, or make estimates. A statistic is a number that describes a sample, whereas a parameter is a number that describes a population. Based on sample statistics, you can draw conclusions about population parameters using inferential statistics. To make statistical inferences, researchers frequently use two main methods, simultaneously. One estimation is the process of calculating population parameters using sample statistics. Two hypothesis testing is a formal process for using samples to test research predictions about the population. Estimation Estimates of population parameters can be made in two ways using sample statistics. One a point estimate is a single value that represents your best guess at the exact parameter. To an interval estimate is a range of values that represents your best guess as to where the parameter is located. If your goal is to infer and report population characteristics from sample data, your paper should include both point and interval estimates. When you have a representative sample, you can consider a sample statistic to be a point estimate for the population parameter, example in a wide public opinion poll. The proportion of a sample that supports the current government is taken as the population proportion of government supporters. Because there is always some degree of error in estimation, you should also provide a confidence interval as an interval estimate to demonstrate the variability around a point estimate. A confidence interval conveys where you generally expect to find the population parameter most of the time by using the standard error and the z-score from the standard normal distribution. Testing hypotheses You can test hypotheses about relationships between variables in the population using data from a sample. Hypothesis testing begins with the assumption that the null hypothesis is true in the population, and statistical tests are used to determine whether or not the null hypothesis can be rejected. Statistical tests determine where your sample data would fall on a sample data expected distribution if the null hypothesis were true. These tests produce two main results. A test statistic indicates how much your data differs from the test's null hypothesis. A p-value indicates the probability of obtaining your results if the null hypothesis is true in the population. Statistical tests are classified into three types, 
One comparison tests examine the differences in outcomes between groups. Two regression tests examine the relationship between variables causes and effects. Three correlation tests evaluate relationships between variables without making assumptions about causation. The statistical test you use is determined by your research questions, research design, sampling method, and data characteristics. Parametric tests Based on sample data, parametric tests make powerful inferences about the population. However, certain assumptions must be met before they can be used, and only certain types of variables can be used. If your data contradicts these assumptions, you can use appropriate data transformations or alternative non-parametric tests. A regression model predicts how changes in a predictor variable affect changes in an outcome variable, s. One predictor variable and one outcome variable are included in a simple linear regression. A multiple linear regression model contains two or more predictor variables and one outcome variable. Typically, comparison tests compare the means of groups. These can be the means of different groups within a sample, for example, a treatment and control group, the means of one sample group taken at different times, for example, pre-test and post-test scores, or a sample mean and a population mean. When the sample size is small, a t-test is used for exactly one or two groups, 30 or less. When the sample size is large, a z-test is used for exactly one or two groups. An ANOVA is used when there are three or more groups. The Z and T tests are classified into subtypes based on the number and type of samples used, as well as the hypotheses, use a one-sample test if you only have one sample to compare to a population mean. Use a dependent, paired, samples test if you have paired measurements, within subjects design. Use an independent, unpaired, Samples test if you have completely separate measurements from two unmatched groups, between subjects design. Use a one-tailed test if you expect a difference between groups in a specific direction. Use a two-tailed test if you have no expectations about the direction of a difference between groups. Pearson's R is the only parametric correlation test. The correlation coefficient, R, expresses the strength of a linear relationship between two numerical variables. To determine whether the correlation in the sample is strong enough to be significant in the population, you must also perform a correlation coefficient significance test, typically a t-test, to obtain a p-value. This test makes use of your sample size to determine how far the correlation coefficient deviates from zero in the population. Step 5. Interpret your findings. The final step in statistical analysis is to interpret your findings. Statistical importance. Statistical significance is the primary criterion for drawing conclusions in hypothesis testing. To determine whether your results are statistically significant or not, you compare your p-value to a predetermined significance level, usually 0.05. Statistically significant results are thought to be unlikely to have occurred by chance. If the null hypothesis is true in the population, such a result has a very low probability of occurring. Errors in judgment. Type I and type II errors occur in research conclusions. A type I error is when the null hypothesis is rejected when it is true, whereas a type II error is when the null hypothesis is not rejected when it is false. By selecting an optimal significance level and ensuring high power, you can aim to reduce the risk of these errors. However, because there is a trade-off between the two errors, a delicate balance is required. Statistics, Frequentist versus Bayesian. Frequentist statistics has traditionally emphasized null hypothesis significance testing and always begins with the assumption of a true null hypothesis. However, in recent decades, Bayesian statistics has grown in popularity as an alternative approach. Using previous research, you constantly update your hypotheses based on your expectations and observations in this approach. The Bayes factor compares the relative strength of evidence for the null hypothesis versus the alternative hypothesis rather than concluding whether or not the null hypothesis should be rejected. Hope you find this step-by-step -step guide of 5 steps insightful and knowledgeable anytime you feel like you are not able to do the statistical analysis on your own. 
Call us right away and we will do that for you. Stay tuned to Research Graduate to get more such videos. Till then happy research. Also if you have any of the PhD and Master's related service requirements, visit our website 